Regina, my old tug, and I are steaming through Burgundy. I'm on a quest to discover if Burgundy has preserved its customs and history. When I arrived in the port of Dijon, I heard there was a chef in town who really did know how to make coco vin à l'ancienne, one of Burgundy's great traditional dishes. I locked up the boat and set off to his restaurant called Le Chabreau. Dijon, the capital of Burgundy, was the seat of the Dukes of Burgundy, whose domains once stretched from the Low Countries, Belgium and Holland, to very near Lyon. The Dukes were richer than the kings of France. Sadly, modern Dijon is only really beautiful from the knees up. With increasingly rare exceptions, most of Dijon at street level has been ruined by modernity. Keep your eyes up and you will be rewarded with delightful visual surprises. In Burgundy, varnished tiles are a big feature. They're made to exactly the same measurements as they were over 1,000 years ago. If you're repairing a roof like this, all the varnish tiles you buy from the factory in Pontigny will fit nicely, even if the roof was built centuries before. into this shop to buy some batteries. The owner showed me what the two men at the counter had come in for. He said that dogs, like everyone else in Burgundy, had big appetites. This is what they do to remote controllers when they're a bit peckish. Dizon's renowned pain de piece shop is a treasure trove of good things. I noticed Mark Fallow's mustard on sale, and so I decided to go and see how the feisty stuff was made. Mark, a third generation mustard maker, told me he hoped his little boy was going to continue the family business. Anybody can make Dijon mustard. In fact, the Canadians make more of it than anyone else. The mustard Mark Fallow makes is especially good because it's a cold process. These seeds are ground by huge stones and then mixed with white wine, vinegar and special spices. I used to think that French mustard was really rather mild, but the stuff they make in this factory has a real kick. I had a nice cold beer whilst waiting for my audience with the king of the coq au vin. Outside his Dijon restaurant, Christian Boy gave me what I thought was simple instructions. Buy me three cocks in Luan Market and come to see me tomorrow night and we'll choose the wine to cook them in. Simple enough. Gradually, it dawned on me that the cocks I would buy would be live. Then I found I couldn't just use any old cock for coq au vin. They had to have spurs on their ankles to show they were old enough for a true coq au vin. My head was soon spinning with good advices, and I felt dangerously ready to take the plunge. I was fast becoming a specialist on the spur required, even though I was beginning to wonder whether I should have embarked on this adventure in the first place. Now there's a champion for you, but he's not for sale. It took me some time to locate a trader with three suitable birds. 
I didn't feel I had the expertise yet to manage my fowl like this woman. A box in which to transport these energetic birds was clearly necessary. By this time, I was feeling rather foolish, as one does when one realizes that one has bitten off a lot more than one can chew. There was a buzz going around that there was a deal in the office. Whilst I waited for the birds to arrive, I felt every curious eye upon me. Every Monday morning for centuries, people have been trading poultry here in Luan. My man pulled a struggling bird out of his cage and showed me the tag that indicated that it had been bred in breath and also it had well-developed spurs on its ankles. I paid $12 each for the birds and when the finances were out of the way, he shoved my purchases into the red cage. After a couple of miles of stumbling along with the cocks in the box, I find it was getting very heavy indeed. It was quite easy to resist being sentimental about the demise of the birds. As I sped along the coat door, one of the world's great wine growing districts, a few of the vineyard's names came to mind. Poma, Alex Corton, Nuit Saint-Georges, Vaughan Romanet, Gevry Chambatin, and Marcenet, where I was heading to meet the chef. He gave one of the cocks a good going over. He pulled its legs and wings apart and pronounced it to be a fine bird and was satisfied with the all-important spurs. Next day, I moored at Sir, an old market town on the River Seine, to await Christian's arrival. Every day in the summer, these five ladies put on their white shoes and sit on this bench to chat and gaze at the River Seine. They told me they'd all gone to school together and they'd been friends ever since. <laughs> With his knife case and all the ingredients for a true coq au vin à l'ancienne, the intrepid chef led his assistant, Alexandre, aboard the Regina. I took the boat to a secluded part of the river, for the dish the chef was about to produce contravened all the rules of the Euro norm, the directive that the bureaucracy in Brussels had imposed on professional chefs. So this is a recipe you'll never eat legally in any European restaurant. Le sel gros. Sea salt, Le poivre crushed or rolled pepper. Voilà. Don't be afraid, he tells Alexandre. It's not your sister or your mother. Mais non, non, non. No, not like that. Look, you stick your fingers in and pull it like this. There you are. You keep the carcass, cut it in two and put it in with the rest. Here's a bouquet garni made with leeks, thyme, laurel leaves and celery leaves. You peel the onions and then cut them up small. You put a little bit of sel, you put a then you put in the chicken. Crush the garlic with your knife. Don't chop it up because the garlic juice is too strong and it sticks to the meat. The chef had bought a good burgundy from his friend's cellar in Marcenet, which he said had just the right flavor for this recipe. The chef explained he'd bought another bottle of wine, a hybrid wine, 
which is made in an old-fashioned way. It's much darker than the normal red wines because the grapes are left in the juice far longer than the Euro norm would permit. The Euronorm standards do not allow any meat to be marinated for more than three hours. This coq au vin needs at least 12. The chef said once the coq is marinated, you take it out, recover the carrots, the bouquet garni and the onions. Fry the chicken till it's nice and brown and then put in all the bits from the marinade, a good cognac, and you set it on fire, and leave it to cook for two hours. Fry the bacon in some butter, and then add the mushroom. Take out the cooked chicken. Mix the carrot puree well into the sauce at the bottom of the pan. Taste it for seasoning and add a bit of salt. All the chicken is back in the sauce. Don't overcook the garniture. Voilà. These croutons have been fried in butter. Dip the ends lightly in the sauce, dip the end into the parsley, and place it on the edge of the plate. And there you are, a true coq à l'ancienne, even though it's not politically correct. Christian invited me to the wine harvest in his village, San Colombe, to show me how the hybrid wine was made. Before I left for the wine harvest, I decided to do a few necessary jobs on the boat. <laughs> I fitted a new top to my central heating boiler's chimney. The old one had hit a tree. Whilst I was up there, I watched a family of ducks practicing for the duck slalom championship down the sloping sides of a lock. Much to the annoyance of their mother. Painting a boat is a job that never ends, and alas, I've never been good at it. Deep in the heart of the Morvan National Park lies the old water mill at Cayo, which was functioning full time until a few years ago. The miller showed me how it operated. The sluice gate is opened and water pours from the lake and turns the mill wheel, which in turn drives all these belts and cogs. The cogs are made from hard boxwood. I love the sound of all this ramshackle machinery. Early one golden summer's morning, the natural coda to a midsummer's night, I visited lockkeeper Alain. His work leaves him with plenty of spare time. Alain is a man with a hobby. He is a collector of just about everything local. Seven years ago, he started a museum in the cellar of his little lock house. C'est votre exhibition, monsieur. Ah oui. Wine bottles collected from well-heeled passing tourists. Labels from local wines carefully steamed off bottles and dried. Warning notices about the danger of the abuse of alcohol. Postcards from a century ago found in his parents' belongings who operated this lock as well. A French grammar and a battered copy of Robinson Crusoe make up the library section. A wine barrel spigot and a collection of coins from all over the world. Even his mother's school photograph from the 1930s. Master of his museum, Alain is a true collector.
Saint Colom nestles like the head of a beautiful woman on the shoulder of mighty Burgundy. It boasts two female saints and a tiny vineyard. There are so many saints' names everywhere in France that hardly anyone knows who they all were. Saint Colom was a young Spanish nun who, when her nunnery was overrun by Moors, had her head chopped off because she told the invaders they'd got it all wrong and Mohammed was a false prophet. St. Barbara has an even sadder story. Her wicked father locked her up in a tower for being too beautiful. Barbara decided if men were like her father, she would give them up and become a Christian nun. Her charming father had her beheaded when he found out. Otherwise, village life is remarkably peaceful. Granny's granny, berries ripen, onions dry, and rabbits, well, rabbits, rabbit. Once a year on the third weekend of September, as they have for centuries, all the inhabitants of St. Colomb gird up their loins and harvest the grape. Humans have been drinking wine for well over 10,000 years and all the grapes that ever were have been cloned from the same source. Wine has always been thought of as safer than water. Wine drinkers were healthier and more fertile. The immortal W.C. Fields, when confronted with the offer of a glass of water, remarked, bristling with outrage, water, fishes, in it. The man in the red coat and the black fedora is none other than the king of the Cocovin, Christian Bouy, who lives in the village. Today he's playing the plantation owner, encouraging his troops. Wine inspires poets, lovers, musicians, and just about anyone whose soul veers towards the romantic side of the canal. Dangling an elegant panatella from Havana from his fingers, he checks everyone is hard at it. This grey-hat gentleman picking grapes is Gilbert, co-owner of the vineyard with Christian. Gilbert's not afraid of getting his hands dirty. Christian told me that these white grapes belong to Gilbert. These grapes are stripped from their stalks and pressed straight away. Then the juice is put into a barrel to ferment. My white grapes are stripped from their stalks and left with their skins for 24 hours to get the full flavor of the grapes. We'll press them tomorrow. I'm always amazed that a bunch of these little fellows could bring so much pleasure, and if taken in excess, so much hangover. All morning long, Christian exhorts the boys, adopting the time-honored, you heave, I'll grunt stance of the boss man. The village tractor lumbers off with another load of Gilbert's grapes for the press. Gilbert's grandchildren, Victor and Alice, help their grandfather harvest his grapes. Christian announces it's 10 past 11, only 50 minutes to go till the 12 o'clock lunch break. In France, everything stops at noon for a meal. I calculated that the age spread of the pickers was at least 77 years, which is proof that continuity still exists somewhere.
back in the village, the pressure press was working overtime. Christian samples the raw grape juice and pronounces it good. Christian, back in his host mode now, prepared the lunch for the pickers around the roaring fire in his house. I left them all to enjoy their well-earned lunch and went to watch how the big boys do it in the valley next door. These grapes are trembling. It's not much fun being a grape in a commercial vineyard. A bunch of stalks is all that's left of a vine summer's work. Canel is delighted the lunch break is over. After lunch, it's the turn of the red grapes, the Pinot Noir. Picking the right moment to harvest grapes must be as chancy as getting the right story, actor and director for a film producer like me. Christian should certainly be able to knock off quite a few coco vins with the wine from this lot. Mathilde, leader of the children's gang, makes a fashionably late entrance on the scene just as everyone else is packing up. The giraffe starts to press the red grapes. Round the back, a group of traditionalists are working a small hand press. The days of barefooted girls stomping about in grape-filled barrels with their skirts hitched up round their waists are a last over. Mathilde and her gang are given the task of rounding up all the secateurs. Madeleine told me when she was a child in the wine harvest, she filled her pockets with grapes so that when the other children came to squash grapes down her neck, she had her own ammunition. <laughs> the giraffe is put away for the season. For some, the fatigue of the day begins to show. I wonder if he'll be picking grapes here in 75 years' time. I hope he will. I bet he will. Fulfilled and satisfied, the ladies slip in a quick chat before the party begins. Eh bien, voilà la vendange terminée. Christian announces to the world that the harvest is over for another year. Christian produced a delicious soup and mountains of lasagne for the pickers.
Christian cuts a tart he's made, and the dancing starts. Ah, the dancing, how I love that accordion. Whilst there are Frenchmen and vines, towards the end of September, days like these will continue for the rest of time, I hope. Don't change, Saint Colomb. I think you've got it right. I leave you with a lump in my throat.